So we ended the last video by talking about the fact that general purpose polyhedral scheduling of loop nests uh, is just too hard and too difficult to do code generation for, and we need some more limited scheduling model that allows us to efficiently interleave the operations we want to do in hardware, um, that gives us a tractable optimization problem to solve when we're trying to come up with the interleaving, um, and that is guaranteed to have an output form that we can translate into efficient hardware automatically. And so here's an idea about what that schedule might be. <coughs> we might try to approximate the scheduling problem with what's called synchronous data flow. So in synchronous data flow, um, basically it's a programming model, a very old one that goes back to the late 80s, where programs are graphs of nodes that are going to wait for data to arrive on channels that connect one node to another. And then every node is going to fire or produce data when enough data is available. And a crucial restriction of synchronous data flow is that each node is going to produce and consume the same amount of data on each firing. So just as an example of how SDF works, and we'll get into uh, how we can model loop nests uh, as SDF later, Suppose we have an operation, uh, three operations in our SDF graph. We have an input to an up sample, which I've labeled as U. An up sample takes in one piece of data on each firing and produces two pieces of data on each firing. Uh, then we have a channel or a FIFO with two slots connecting the up sample to an add. Add is a binary operation that takes in one piece of data on one edge, one piece of data on the other edge, and outputs one piece of data, right, because it's a binary operation. And then at the bottom, connected to the adder as well, we have a multiplier which takes in one piece of data on each firing, produces one piece of data on each firing, and we've connected the multiplier to the adder with a FIFO of size one. <coughs> so in SDF, we would say that we found a legal firing schedule if we've found a way to fire each node <coughs> so that the total amount of data in the FIFOs through the firing doesn't change, uh, so we can repeat it uh, infinitely without increasing the total uh, amount of data in our buffers, and if every node fires at least once. So <clears throat> let's just look at an example of this firing schedule. First, we're going to fire our up sample. So we're going to take in one piece of data and output two, and we're going to put those two pieces of data in this FIFO. Then we're going to fire our multiplier, which is going to take in a piece of data and put it into its FIFO. Then we're going to fire the adder, and the adder is going to consume one piece of data from each FIFO. So now the multiply FIFO is empty, and the upsample FIFO contains only one thing. <coughs> then we're going to fire our multiplier again, and we're going to put one more piece of data in the FIFO. Then we're going to fire our adder again, and now the multiplier FIFO and the upsample FIFO are empty. We've fired every single node at least once, and so we can repeat this sequence over and over again without uh, overflowing our buffers. So why is SDF useful? Well, it has a few advantages and disadvantages. Um, the advantage of SDF is that it's possible to find efficient deadlock-free schedules um, without super complex uh, and sophisticated scheduling. So this, the SDF scheduling algorithm is pretty straightforward. The con is that schedules have a very limited form. So every schedule uh, can only have one variable. So the schedule function for P is sp of x fires at time qp, which you could call the firing rate, times x plus dp, where d is the delay. And the other con, which is a more subtle one, is that each node <coughs> produces and consumes the same amount of data on each firing. And that's a surprisingly onerous restriction. So to understand why that's such a significant restriction, let's go back to our original circuit. So Here's the optimized hardware that we want to generate for our upsampling operation. <coughs> is this SDF? Well, the input adder is an SDF node because it takes in one piece of data and produces one piece of data on each activation of the adder. And ditto for the output adder because it's the same kind of object. So now we're left with the question, is this register an SDF node? And the answer is it kind of depends on how we define the nodes and the firing. So the register, if you remember, takes in one piece of data and then it outputs two pieces of data, um, but it does so over several cycles. So we can say that this area of the graph is approximately synchronous data flow if we define one firing to take place over multiple clock cycles, right? So one piece of data comes in and then two pieces of data come out. But if we think of a firing in the traditional sense as representing the action of a node on a clock cycle, then this write enable is not, or excuse me, this up sample area is not a synchronous data flow node because it takes in one piece of data on one cycle and produces a piece of data, but then on the next cycle it takes in nothing and produces a piece of data. So the amount of data produced and consumed in each cycle 
um, is not time invariant if we define a firing as the data produced and consumed by a node every cycle. <coughs> but as I mentioned, if we say, you know, approximately, you know, a firing is actually three cycles, say, uh, where we take in data, or two cycles, where we take in data and output data, and then output data again and take in nothing, then we can think of this as being a, a periodic synchronous data flow node that takes in one piece of data and produces two. So for our dependence, our scheduling problem, we can use the synchronous data flow approximation. We can call the uh, first guy the producer, or PI, and we can call the second guy the consumer, and we'll say instances of the consumer are CJ. And we're given this data dependency, and our goal is to create two linear functions of this form uh, that respect this data dependency and interleave operations as much as possible. And so in the next video, I'll talk about how we solve this problem because it's actually a nonlinear problem in general, but there's an easy workaround that involves uh, rate setting and delay setting. So in the next video, I'll talk about the math behind solving uh, scheduling equations and their constraints like this. So I'll see you in the next video.